Welcome to the Miller Report Real Clear Journalism. I'm Maggie Miller. We're taking a look at Vince Bielski's latest investigation that looks at a growing global scam that's creeping into American science, putting the credibility of research itself at risk. The issue? Paper mills. An underground industry selling fake academic studies and authorship slots to researchers desperate to pad their resumes in the publish or perish world of academia. An issue that was concentrated in Asia and Eastern Europe has moved west and spread to the United States. Tens of thousands of these mill journal papers have been published, and as one scientist puts it, all they are is a fancy piece of rubbish. Five years ago, the Committee on Publishing and Ethics found about 2% of submitted papers came from mills. A recent study found the number of suspected paper mill articles is doubling every 18 months, outpacing legitimate science. And it's not just small or obscure journals that are falling victim. These mill papers are making it into prestigious publishers. Watchdogs say more than 140 retracted papers have listed American co-authors, and nearly 200 have included names from Western Europe. Some scholars may have knowingly bought authorship. Others may be victims of outright name theft used to lend credibility to bogus studies. These mills are getting smarter, using AI to turn out dozens of papers at a time, and even infiltrating the peer review process by suggesting their own fake reviewers. Critics warn this wave of scientific fraud misleads researchers who may build off of other published fabricated work and could warp entire fields of study. Yet universities and publishers have been slow to respond in many cases, hampered by bureaucracy, reputational fears, and a system that has rewarded quantity. I'm joined now by the lead investigator on this story, Vince Bilski. Vince, thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here. So how is real research paying the price for this fake science, and how does this create distrust in science? Well, it creates distrust because increasingly uh, paper mills are conspiring with academic researchers to um, produce fraudulent papers that are getting published in a wide range of journals, both low and high impact factor journals. And the, uh, the extent and the scale is, is eye-popping at times, depending on the journal and depending on the subject. Journals uh, have reported that they f find that as many as almost 50% of submissions are suspect and could be coming from paper mills. Um, the, the average number appears to be much lower than that. That, the, that is the average number the journals suspect um, papers uh, originating from paper mills may be around 2%. It depends on the, again, it depends on the subject. If once a journal publishes a fraudulent paper, they become um, the target for attack and they're bombarded with more fraudulent papers. That's how the, the percentage goes is so high. So what this does for the research community is hard to tell at this point. Um, there's so much that is not known about the impact of fraudulent pub publishing, but certainly one potential impact is that because these papers can be very sophisticated, produced um, both long, full of data, and um, full of various scientific citations, that researchers can be led to believe that the finding of the paper may be legitimate if the papers and thus incorporate that into his or her own analysis and future work. Um, researchers don't know the extent to which this is going on, partly because they don't know the full extent to which fraudulent papers are being published. And scientists don't like to uh, report that they are being uh, fooled into chasing false leads. So, um, but certainly just the fact that so much research today is under suspicion is, is a major concern. Think about the time that uh, researchers are spent doing fraudulent work when they should be doing real work, because what they're really doing is just chasing um, um, citations in their own publications to advance their careers. So the whole incentive um, structure of academic publishing is what's in question. Um, because in the you know perish, perish, um, published to publish or perish culture, what's happening is <clears throat> um, the overabundance of publications um, is 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 fueled by the fact that universities and research centers are demanding this, 
and the on the other side the publishers themselves are in um in one more prominent business model which is the you know pay to publish model they're uh they're being paid to publish these articles so the, the incentive of, from the publishing side is the more the better because that increases their revenue so there's structural problems uh both on the academic side and the publishing side that uh, a lot of people are, are struggling now to come up with solutions for uh, i was going to mention the the whole publisher parish of it all has really it's almost the natural, per, unfortunate natural progression of the system that they created themselves. Why does it feel like the community isn't more worried, isn't doing more to combat this now becoming prominent issue within the world of research and academia? Well, researchers that care about this subject, and increasingly it's getting more and more attention, are attempting to do things um, on the academic institutional side. There is a lot of talk and thinking about how the process of evaluate, evaluating scientists and researchers might need to change and how that could change. So they're not simply evaluated on the number of papers they publish in high impact journals and the citations those papers receive in you know in other publications. So how it is so it's a very, as you can see, it's a very deep problem. How do you change the way universities and research centers evaluate their staff? That's a big question. Um and what are other ways to go about it? So so there's discussion and proposals on that side on um and then just following the chain of how a public a paper gets published. There are, there, you know, the big five academic publishers are coming under heavy criticism, and there's a, a lawsuit in the, that's been filed um, last year on this matter about the incentive structure on that end. That you have to understand that the researchers are not um, being paid anything by the by the journals to produce these papers. Essentially, they're working off grants or their salaries. They produce the the papers. The the publishers then require them to pay to uh and you know a publishing fee to publish the papers so on that side of the spectrum how do you change the incentive structure on of, on the publishers uh and th that's that's a very difficult question um universities you know in the, in the prior model the, the university would have, you know, would basically pay to subscribe to the publication and giving access to, you know, everybody that was part of that university and could benefit from that subscription to read those papers, right? But those subscriptions are very ex expensive and they limit access to the research. So a, a new model came came about a couple decades ago and has been growing, which is let's open the uh, access to everybody. So these um, this form of public publication does not require su subscription. Anybody can read these papers that are written by the academics, except that the academics have to pay to publish them. There's So there's a problem with that model too. So, um, you know, everyone from academic researchers to private nonprofit organizations to uh, independent scientific sleuths to federal government officials are looking at this and trying to, to grapple with it because ultimately what it impacts is our quest for understanding it, the, the quality of science that we do and, and, and is our money being well spent as we pursue um, you know various fields in science. It, it feels difficult. Something that I kind of walked away with from your investigation was how do you hold the researchers accountable when they do, when they are acting nefariously and they are paying for this milled work? If just anybody could probably argue, oh no, like I didn't do that. My name was stolen. Even though you might need to take it with a grain of salt, maybe their name isn't big enough for a mill to want to steal. But I mean, you'd have to go deep into an investigation to be able to find out whether or not these people did act nefariously. Right. So the accountability structure is another issue. Um, essentially, universities and research centers with some standards set by the federal government are responsible for holding their own researchers accountable. But there's the inherent conflict of interest 
in in that system. So if a university chief academic officer is is running the investigation with with staff of their own academics own, own researchers, um, they may or may not be incentivized to get to the truth of what happened and whether or not that university researcher um, acted, um, you know, properly or, or committed misconduct, either cheating and manipulating data themselves or in collaboration with the paper mill. Both both are happening. And so what, what we find is that the, the, the first problem is a lack of transparency. So we Universities are not under the obligation to report on their investigations, whether or not there is even an investigation occurring, much less the outcome of the investigation. Federal right, and the reason they do that is, on the one hand, to protect the confidentiality of a sensitive investigation. After all, academic careers are on the line, and we don't want to um, derail uh, a, a professional career uh, simply with an accusation of misconduct. So they're protecting the, the confidentiality of their people, and that's understandable. At the same time, they're not reporting the outcomes of those investigations. So, for example, they are permitted by regulation to report if they find one of their uh, academic researchers has committed some form of misconduct. That can be um, reported that needs to be reported to the federal government, but that also can be publicized by the university. Most of them choose not to do so. Every now and then, we have big profile, big high profile cases that emerge. Recall the case in Stanford. There's been a case at Harvard. There's a case um, at the Data Farber, you know, Research Institute in Boston. There are there are numerous cases that that do finally get publicized and draw public notice but those are just the high profile ones and the run of the mill bread and butter misconduct which in some ways is much more important because it's more widespread is is um you know we don't really have a sense uh, 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 of the degree to which universities are fully investigating that to, to slow it down and to curb it it's really difficult because there has been a mounting distrust in science over the years. And and this is just another another thing that people are going to stick in their pocket and add to their list of why they may not trust uh, everything that's being put forth before them. What would you want to leave people with? And what message do you want to leave people with, more importantly? Well, that, you know, the, sci the scientific process is, is an important one to protect and preserve. And so, um, and there are so many players in the process from the researchers to the universities, to the funding agencies, to the publishers, that, that um, everybody involved uh, needs to do more to bring ac more accountability to the system. It's, you know, it's not that the system, it's, 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 the process itself works well when it works, but it's it's now what we're finding is it's easily corrupted. And so, I mean, I think the good news is there's increasing, increasingly researchers, institutions, advocates, federal officials are paying more attention to this and realizing it's a problem. At the moment, what we're seeing, you know, with the Trump administration is is they're finding ways to exploit the problem by bringing their own ideological agenda into the mix and questioning this, you know, looking at the issues I'm talking about, but coming up with solutions that are more ideologically focused. So I don't think, um, you know, federal officials are from the Trump administration um, while highlighting some of these issues are necessarily advocating for um, for the proper accountability that needs to happen to to get to solutions. But that aside, the scientific community itself is has been gearing up and increasingly is is a, you know attacking this problem. So there there is progress. It's really fascinating to see how how it's all going to work out. It's 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 going to be a big long gnarly story that's going to go on for a long time, but. Um, it all begins with exposure to the problem. And I think that's where we are now, that that there's no denying that the problem is real. The problem of fraudulent science is getting worse. 
and the number of people that are that are um, starting to address it is also increasing in a remarkable ways. So, um, so there's reason for optimism. Exactly, realizing something is a problem is the first step, and obviously, that's not to discredit all science. There's still some amazing things that researchers are looking into and helping uh, progress for our scientific discovery. Vince, thank you so much for your time. Happy to be here. That was it for the Miller Report Real Clear Journalism. I'm Maggie Miller. I'll see you next time.